Coming up on DTNS, Apple proves the first trillion is the hardest. Instagram is helping you get less caught up, and BlackBerry phones get a new lease on life. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, August 19th, 2020 in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Rich Straffolino. I'm Scott Johnson in Salt Lake City. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking uh, all about comic books, uh, indie labels, Marvel, DC. So if you want to hear about that, you can get the wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet, by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. But let's get to the tech news and let's start with a few tech things you should know. India's Business Standard reports that, according to sources, Apple is planning to produce some of the upcoming iPhone 12 devices locally in India. The devices are expected to be made in Wistron's factory in Bengaluru and available in mid-2021. Very nice. Samsung launched Samsung Pay Card in the UK. It is a MasterCard debit card that consolidates existing bank accounts and cards into a single card and digital wallet. Samsung Pay Card uses the fintech startup curve on the back end and gets access to features of the platform, including its go back in time feature, which lets users move transactions from one payment source to another retroactively. Instagram began rolling out the ability to generate QR codes that link to a profile globally. The feature was originally released in Japan last year. The QR codes can be scanned by any supporting third-party camera app and will eventually replace the previously used name tag system. Ooh, uh, Google updated its information that will surface on activity cards in its mobile app. Shopping cards will now show similar products that users have searched for, as well as a relevant review of the product or reviews if you're looking for them. Jobs cards will show new job listings that match previous searches. And receipt cards, or excuse me, and receipt cards were updated to show related receipts to recent searches, as well as surfacing thumbnail images. I believe that's recipes, Scott. Did I say receipt? Receipts. Although a receipt card it sounds like it would be very cool. Oh, I got a really good spaghetti receipt. You should see. <laughs> uh, in other news, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory integrated a wafer scale engine chip from the company's Cerebrus systems into its Lawson supercomputer. This chip is composed of 1.2 trillion transistors and uses an entire 12-inch silicon wafer. Usually those are diced up to make a bunch of little chips. For comparison, recent AMD Epic 2 chips have 32 billion transistors, so slightly smaller. The chips will be used to accelerate AI research at the lab. Mm, wafers. Uh, Lucid Motors announced that its upcoming Lucid Air electric sedan will support fast charging that can add 20 miles of uh, range per minute of charging. That's pretty good. The Air uses a 900-volt charger with a peak charging rate of over 300 kilowatts. Uh, Lucid is partnering with Electrify America to bring out these chargers uh, to some of the company's 2,000 charger network and will use combined charging system standard chargers. Uh, you know, those of you who uh, use these already will know what the heck those are. Lucid also said it's developing a bi-directional home charger for the vehicle, which will allow owners to use the vehicle to power their home. That's an interesting concept. Uh, and in security news, security researchers at Gardecore Labs announced the discovery of what they believe to be previously undiscovered botnet. Dubbed Fritz Frog, the botnet uses proprietary code to infect SSH servers with in-memory payloads, then gathers multiple infected servers into a peer-to-peer -peer network. The researchers first spotted the botnet in January and believe it's infected over 500 servers, including U.S. and European universities and a railroad company. All right, let's talk a little bit more, though, about the big story that, you know, we talked about a chip with uh, 1.2 billion transistors, but uh, if those were dollars, that would be pocket change for Apple. Uh, you know what they say, that first trillion, it's the hardest. In August 2018, Apple became the first U.S. company to reach a $1 trillion market cap. Apple stock recently climbed now to $467.77, setting its market cap at $2 billion based on the number of outstanding shares at that price. That's basically what market cap is. Apple is not the first company to hit this uh, target, uh, with the oil company Saudi um, uh, Armaco reaching $2 trillion in December 2019. How does that compare to other tech giants, you may be asking? Well, Microsoft has a $1.6 trillion market cap. Amazon has a $1.652 uh, trillion. Market cap, Alphabet's at a mere $1.06 trillion, and Facebook with a punny $757 billion market cap. Recent surge in the S&P 500, though, saw the stock of all of these five companies up 37% since the start of 2020, despite, you know, all of this uh, COVID business, while the rest of that index, the S&P 500, I would assume that's, what, 495 companies, uh, fell a combined 6%. 
So, you know, Scott, uh, I know you're a lauded uh, financial analyst, so I definitely wanted to, to get your take on this. I mean, certainly very, it's kind of amazing that what Apple was founded in the 70s and it yeah. took them until 2018 to hit that $1 trillion valuation. Now, I know a lot of this is, hey, the stock price went up and, a, you know, there's a little, uh, you know, it, the finance world is different than the real world in some instances. But going from adding another trillion dollars in a matter of less than two years is a pretty remarkable feat and says a lot about the transformation that that company is continuing to go on. You know, I, I think a lot of that uh, is tied up as, oh, they have the iPhone and that totally transformed the company. Uh, I think it's still it's still being transformed, you know, kind of in this in this moment. Yeah, it is. And it's weird. I always wondered if, you know, after Steve Jobs passed, if we would truly see what a lot of people predicted, which is uh, a change in the company that would lead to a leveling off or even a downward spin or something that that maybe Tim Cook style and his method of management and vision wouldn't match that of Steve Jobs and they wouldn't be able to keep up with that mythos that was the Jobs era. And I think that's all been proven wrong at this point. I mean, say what you want about Apple, say what you want about all this hubbub lately with them and Epic and everybody else in the 70-30 split. They are at the top of their game and they continue to break records. And I also think there's something about when you hit a certain plateau and then you wonder, why, wow, how could they double this in that short amount of time? It's because that momentum now means you're just going to see exponential growth. Uh, I mean, there's always a chance things could dip, but... Uh, if anything, they've been helped by COVID a little bit. Um, people have been home, spending money in their app store, buying their devices, uh, using their services, and they've kept growing those services. So, I guess I'm not that surprised by any of this. I'm just more I'm more surprised how how wrong we were about Jobs, you know, Jobs dying and Tim Rice taking over. Or not just Tim an, Rice. In, an interesting moment that uh, as they're having the spotlight kind of shown on them with Epic, Spotify, all these other companies kind of questioning their app store policies, right as they're you know they they top the two billion dollar mark. Yeah, and for the record, I meant Tim Cook, not Tim Rice. All right, moving on. Zoom announced its video conferencing app will be available on the Amazon Echo Show. That's the one with the screen, folks. Facebook Portal and Google Nest Hub Max later this year. That sounds like a lot of competing things. Well, you might be right, and that's what we're going to talk about. Zoom arrives first on Facebook Portal, which will arrive in September with a dedicated Zoom app, in addition to other video conferencing apps announced today from BlueJeans, GoToMeeting, and WebEx, some of the usual suspects there. Portal devices will also now support logging in to Facebook uh, or to, excuse me, to a Facebook Workplace account. Google will automatically pull in Zoom meeting from Google Calendar and allow users to join calls with a voice command. Uh, Echo Show devices will get a similar integration, allowing for devices with linked calendars to join by voice without entering in any meeting IDs or passwords. Pretty interesting. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's I think there's two big components to this, Scott. Uh, the first one, though, is just the sheer uh, um, market presence that Zoom has in this video conferencing space. You know, those are three companies that don't usually want to get along on anything. They certainly don't get along on any you know uh, cross uh, platform video conferencing. Yet they're all opening themselves up to kind of better integrate with what has seemingly become a de facto standard in Zoom. I mean, certainly speaks to the power of Zoom uh, in the marketplace. Yeah, like I didn't, I don't know about you, but I thought this Zoom, this love affair we're all having with Zoom, I know some people are still annoyed at it and are worried about security issues, but aside from that, it's become like the term Kleenex or Band-Aid. People use it more and more often as a way of saying, we need to have a meeting. Now they're saying we need to Zoom or we need to have a Zoom meeting. Um, as annoying as that may be for some of us to hear, that usually speaks to the ubiquity of a product, and it means that they have made serious inroads during this time. So I'm not surprised by all of that. What surprises me is the likes of Facebook and Google or anyone else willing to play ball like this. It must be formidable enough for them to go, well, we can either keep fighting this and trying to force people down our systems, or we can be a little more open and have our systems, but also theirs too. And I'm actually surprised this isn't a story about Facebook trying to figure out a way to buy Zoom or even Google for that matter, because it does seem like the kind of company they might just want to throw a bunch of cash at and cash at and you know remove them from the from the competition. Well, the the other element that I think is really important here is the pivot that Facebook is quietly making, and it's kind of hidden in this announcement. Now, all these companies have their own blog posts. About about this, but you know, Facebook Portal has been on the market for a couple of years. They have the the weird ads where the dad's helping make pasta or something like that, and it has some cool tech. You know, it does the the crop in the video to follow you along and and some interesting stuff. But this is a huge pivot for them to say, okay, 
um, maybe that consumer market's not taking off. Let's bring in, you know, Blue Jeans is owned by Verizon. It's an enterprise power, or, uh, it's an enterprise presence when it comes to video conferencing. Go to meeting WebEx or, you know, enterprise standards when it comes to that. Zoom used to be that uh, and now is, has a wider consumer presence. To me, integrating it with Workplace, this is Facebook uh, kind of quietly pivoting that product and going, hey, if, we're, if you want dedicated Zoom hardware, guess what? You now have it effectively with a Facebook portal as well. Yep. Next up here, Netflix confirmed to The Verge that it's been testing a shuffle button on the service since July. The exact appearance of the feature has not been finalized, with some users seeing a shuffle play button on the profile selection screen, so you would select that before your profile, and others seeing a play something option on the sidebar menu, kind of once you're logged in and viewing the main Netflix interface. When shuffling, Netflix provides an explanation about what uh, uh, what in your viewing history inspired that shuffle selection, so it's a we played this because you liked Umbrella Academy or something like that. The test of the feature is currently only running on TV devices, so don't expect to see it on your phone anytime soon. But Scott, is this uh, like is, is this something that's been needed in your Netflix experience? Do you want less thinking when it comes to selecting your Netflix content? Man, I'll tell you what, Rich. I have all kinds of questions about this and whether it will work for me. Mainly, I have an account that I use, and this is my own fault because I never set up a second one, but I have one account where I use for my own viewing pleasure of whatever I want to see, and that same account <laughs> I use when I watch these horrible movies I watch on a show called Film Sack. And that show was all about taking bad, old, sometimes new, but movies that are controversial, sometimes they're good, but whatever. It's a huge mix that really messes with their algorithm. It has to. And so I don't know what they're going to try to feed me. Like, they're going to say, <laughs> I'm going to finish an episode, of, I don't know, uh, some old TV show, and it's going to say, maybe you want to watch Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Or, you know, is, where is it going to take me? That's a big question. How much control will I have on that? Uh, is it just purely random where it's anything in the system? Can I uh, do parental controls and say, look, I don't want anything that's outside of a PG rating uh, for, for kids to see? Or in my case, I may not want to see, you know, I don't know, Heart of Dixie again because I hate that show. My <laughs> wife loves it. But I can't stand it. So don't put that in my shuffle. So I have lots of questions about how they're going to integrate this. In theory, though, if they really know me and know what I like, yeah, why not? Especially if I'm just doing some kind of background watching. The other concern is this, though. Let's say I'm just watching away and I'm doing it kind of in the background and it's been fine. I'm watching Cheers or something. And then I'm working away and then beep, it changes over to a show that I know I want to sit, focus and binge on. Well, I can't do that right now. So what am I supposed to do? I just hit skip. Do I like what? Do you, there's a lot of details we don't know, but I'm very curious about it in action. Yeah, and, and there's, I think, two different mentalities when it comes to the UIs that they're using for this. I think the play something where it's integrated into your profile already, that kind of takes care of the parental control situation a little bit. You know, so if you're in a kid's profile, that's presumably would only play kid-friendly content, and then you can just, you know, keep feeding that kid that content sugar pill all day long until, you know, their eyes are bugging out of their head. Uh, with the the shuffle play something though, that to me solves kind of the sit back TV experience problem. I mean, the, the play something where it's in the main menu does that as well. But having it when you just first boot up the Netflix app on your TV or something like that, you know, the first screen that you see is that profile selection. If I can just say, you know what, I, I just want something on. I just want noise, you know, Scott, to your point about having some background stuff. Um, that to me signals to that approach, which I do think is lacking. I mean, I always say that my favorite thing to watch on Netflix is scrolling through the menu and actually not selecting anything for an hour and a half <laughs> while I'm eating a bowl of ice cream or something like that. Like legit, this is half. It's it's the new blockbuster, you know, where you're just wait, you're just waiting through all the VHSs uh, to try and find what you want to watch. Um, I, I do think this is this uh, in, in part, uh, you know, it's kind of similar to what the music industry has had with Discover playlists and that kind of stuff, where Netflix just has such a huge content catalog that's seems to have no sign of slowing down and they need to get in front of people's eyeballs and you know you might you know you hover over it the autoplay thing comes up and kind of annoys you, you go uh, i don't know do i want to watch this thing about these medieval warriors i don't know i i think by okay i'll, I'll give this 10 minutes a try it's related to another show that i really like that i binged and stuff like that helps to solve that um but again to your point it needs to be time aware it needs People need to have better profile integrity, for lack of a better term, because I could see definitely see, you know, whether you're watching as a couple versus yourself versus everybody just watches under the same profile could cause some big problems or, or, or just cause it to be not useful. Not problems, just not useful. Yeah. And the last thing I would say is they do need something like I think Peacock's got it right with channels. I think that uh, Pluto has spawned all of these ideas of having a more random experience. They do need something like that, whether this is it or not. We will have to see. In 2018, 
Instagram rolled out a caught all up, or sorry, you're caught up, or you're caught all up. No, I'm saying it wrong. You're all caught up is what I'm trying to say. There you go, Scott. Jeez, that all was jumping around. Anyway, uh, this is a little notice that appeared when a user had scrolled through all the new content on their feed. This is news to me. I didn't think you could actually do this. But anyway, that's about to change. As Instagram announced, it will now start showing suggested posts when a user has scrolled through their content and they want to see something new. And they'll get a mix of new organic posts and ads, of course. Not going to keep the ads out of there. Instagram said that for many users that follow a large amount of, of accounts, they never see the your caught up ad or the notification anyway. And I never did. And I use enough Instagram. I follow a lot of artists on there. Um, it's mostly why I use Instagram. And I never get this notice ever. It never says I'm caught up. And I didn't think you could. I thought it was a bit, a bit like TikTok where there was a virtually unending supply of content that was just going to flow in front of my face and it would be based on what I watched, what I looked at, and what I might look at next. And so it just makes this zero difference to me. But there's somebody out there who every day dutifully goes through their feed hoping to catch everything. And then when they do, they get this notice. And I guess now we're telling them they got to keep going. I don't know. I don't know if it's they good must, They must keep going, Scott. Yeah, I, yeah that, I, that's what's interesting to me is, yeah, if you follow like a couple hashtags or something like that, odds are you're never, I, I, I've never also seen the you're all caught up. I think I try not to spend too much time on Instagram. I fail at that frequently. And I think things like stories also kind of just kind of give you this constant stream of content that if you follow any number of people, you're kind of never at a loss. What's interesting though is let's think about when they introduced that you're all caught up in 2018. That's when, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, every Apple, all of them were introducing their own, you know, kind of digital wellness initiatives, trying to, you know, let you know how much screen time you're sending on stuff, uh, you know, how much time you're spending in apps, that kind of stuff. And there seemed to be this this moment of, OK, these vi devices are maybe addictive or uh, can, you know, people are using them maybe more than they want to. We want to give people control over to not spend so much time in apps and on their devices. And then this is Instagram going, listen, you're at home. You're going to use one of our competitors if you're not using us. So here's some ads and some some new content just in case you ever get to the bottom. Uh, it, it's a weird moment to me to see that rolled back when seemingly everybody was very gung ho about it for not too long ago. Yeah. And I think it's just that they never got there. So. Well, well yeah, I, I mean, most people, if they never saw this ad or they never saw this notice anyway, like, I guess it makes sense to get rid of it. Why do it? Yeah. And we'll see if that's a, a trend going forward. We see other kind of rollbacks on that. And to your point, with, with TikTok not seemingly worried about that, uh, it does put them at maybe a, an attention disadvantage. Yep. Uh, Paul Ford at Wired, meanwhile, wrote up an interesting column looking at the rise of low and no code platforms, comparing what the software can do versus, quote unquote, real pro programming language like, uh, you know, C Sharp or uh, Swift or anything like that. Low code platforms are hardly new with apps like Microsoft Access and FileMaker being around for decades at this point, essentially providing a simple database with a form making interface on the top of that. New services like Zapier, Coda, AppyPy, and Airtable build on that by integrating other online services to kind of feed the database essentially. Uh, large public cloud providers have also gotten into the game with Amazon launching Honeycode on AWS just a couple weeks ago and Google acquiring the no code startup AppSheet earlier this year. In the piece, Ford argues that real programmers often undervalue data as opposed to overvaluing code, which these platform, which these no and low code platforms emphasize, and that the majority of programs uh, 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 of a program's code is actually focused on moving data to and from databases anyway. So, Scott, I mean, do you have any kind of familiarity with any of these platforms? I'm just kind of curious uh, about you know seeing the value of this versus a quote unquote real app. Well, ages ago when I worked in a in an office. Uh, I remember very distinctly in the late 90s, uh, there was a big push for, well, it seemed like everybody was making their own Microsoft Access databases, their own front ends for that. I had a friend who ran his dental office entirely off of a homemade Microsoft Access build that he mm -hmm. put together with a friend of his that, you know, he's a dentist, he shouldn't be dabbling in there. But at the time, <laughs> it seemed like, wow, look at this, a tool anybody can use if they can learn some of the fundamentals. They can actually make something that's pretty workable and usable. And it was really quite common. Then I feel like there was a, a switch as the internet started to mature, languages started to mature, new languages were coming, were coming out that were a little bit more focused on rapid web development and this sort of thing. And you saw, I don't know, kind of a separation again of somebody who just needs to get something together that's sort of spreadsheety, but maybe a little bit more advanced, needs a few UI elements or whatever, now they got to go back to hiring a full-time programmer. They got to go back to contracting this out or whatever. I like the idea of this coming back around. And I feel like these days we've got the tools to do it faster. 
more efficiently. Like I'm all down for this. I would like to build more things for myself uh, with this. I know you were talking earlier about building a database for something. I was just noticing this the other day. I have got so many collectibles that I've been sent over the years and I don't really know where they all are. I don't know what some of them are worth, the ones I should put on eBay or shouldn't. Where's the box <laughs> five ones I can't find? Maybe it's time for me to build something again. And it would be cool to finally have some tools where I felt like I wasn't weighing over under you know over my head because I'm not a programmer. Yeah, I, I, you know, to your point, Scott. I, yeah, I'm putting together a, a a database or a tracker for things that are in my deep freezer. But I want to use barcodes and stuff like that. And Airtable, you know, does make it a fairly uh, uh, simple to set that up. As nerdy and dorky as that sounds, I need to know how old that ground beef is, Scott. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what what changed though I think it, it, for, from businesses maybe using Microsoft Access is mobile right those platforms really uh, couldn't or weren't designed to kind of speak uh, to mobile and combined I think with the rise of really quality you know software as a service uh, uh, things where okay this isn't exactly what I needed but hey Google Docs is free and I can do some you know I can do some scripty kind of things in that platform. Um, it, those do reach their limits and things like, uh, you know, maybe Zapier is not the best example. That's more of like an if kind of thing, but especially like Airtable, AppyPie really does focus on allowing you to set up kind of basic mobile apps, really does allow, you know, businesses and consumers to a large degree to kind of, okay, here's my intent. I have this very simple thing that I need it to do. It doesn't need to be overly complex, but I need to be able to, to track data, do conditional things with data. And these platforms do have a, a, a lot of utility. And I think it was Ray Ozzy, I saw him commenting on this on Twitter. He was saying that, you know, back in the day, like apps like uh, VisiCalc and Excel, you know, these were kind of the springboards for people to explore more, you know, kind of business coding applications way back in the day. Um, and so, and you know, I think Paul Ford's point was instead of programmers sneering at these or kind of saying, oh, you never really can do anything too complex with them, is to look at these and go, okay, this isn't, this. I, I think calling them low code maybe is a mistake or no code. The code is not the point. The point is to be able to get like value out of data. And that's, I, I think, essentially what a lot of these are focused at. I think it, maybe it's a, a semantics thing that mm -hmm. is causing maybe some of the uh, confusion or, or ill will, perhaps. Yeah, to me, it's just like art or, you know, filmmaking <laughs> or anything else. The tools are made for more and more people to use them. And that's where we're headed with code. Uh, earlier this year, TLC, TCL rather, TLC is a, both a channel and a way to think about life. Tender, loving care. But TCL opted not to renew its license to keep producing BlackBerry-branded phones, uh, leaving it unclear if more handsets with the prominent brand would ever be produced. Well, the Austin-based Onward Mobility. Yeah, that's right. Onward. Onward. Be mobile. Announced it, would, <laughs> it had reached an agreement with the BlackBerry and FIH Mobile Limited to create a 5G BlackBerry-branded device with a physical keyboard, like the old days. Uh, Onward Mobility plans to target the phone strictly at businesses and enterprise professionals with a specific focus on privacy and security. Onward Mobility plans to release the phone in Europe and North America sometime in the first half of next year. So are you going to run out and get one of these, dude? You all set to <laughs> take business to the next level with your physical keyboard BlackBerry device? Well, I am set to become an oil and gas executive, Scott, so I will definitely need uh, a, a secure handset to be able to do that. But like, that's the that's the interesting thing to me is like, you know, onward mobility. We can, I mean, it's an amazing name, first of all. Like, congrats, Austin-based onward mobility. Um, but you know, they're they're someone no one has ever heard of. But there are a ton of companies like that that make these super specific, you know, uh, totally locked down devices for oil and gas executives, government officials, uh, you know, anyone that has like highly secure needs that need to also have mobile hardware. There are a lot of companies out there that can do this and having that BlackBerry brand, which has a lot of equity in the business, still has a lot of goodwill somehow, I think maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm speaking out of turn in that business market. I think this could maybe still work as a very niche play. I mean, clearly that's why TCL isn't making it. They're making their own branded phones at this point. Um, is they they see their own brand having more uh, 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 cachet with uh, consumers at this point. Um, but you know, I'm I'm intrigued to see what they will do. It's probably not something that will you know it, we're not going to see the Verge reviewing the latest BlackBerry phone or anything like that. But you know, uh, good to see the brand. And uh, hey, if you if you need that physical keyboard, there's still a BlackBerry waiting for you. You know, the way I'd always look at this is just like look at a company like IBM when personal computers took off and we moved away from mainframe computing to the norm being something on your desktop. They lost out. They got behind. Even though they led in the, in the mainframe market, they couldn't transition well to this other thing. And software companies started to dominate it. And before you know it, we are where we are today. And you could say the same thing about the phone race. 
And BlackBerry, like IBM of old, got behind, and there was not a lot they could do. So I think it is a good niche play for this other group to license it and do it. If they can find the customers that are really interested in just that, just the benefits of the platform, um, I think it's actually harder to argue that these days because you can you can make a pretty strong argument for iPhones and Android-based phones and say, look, here are the security, you know, these are the measures that are in place, plus these are mainline phones that you can do a lot of other things with and it's not like, you know, some weird archaic thing. But if they end up with a BlackBerry, maybe this is the way to solve whatever small niche that is. And when we say small niche, we could it could be a, you know, multi-million dollar company. And that's enough. It doesn't have to be a, the next trillion dollar leader in the market. It could be a little guy. And Scott, to your point, IBM still sells billions of dollars of Z15 mainframes every year. So, you know, just because right. it's it's no longer the uh, the new hotness doesn't mean someone can't make a business out of it uh, somewhere. And uh, hey, if you want to get caught up on all of the tech headlines each day in about five minutes and sometimes hear my voice, you can subscribe to Daily Tech Headlines at dailytechheadlines.com. And of course, you can join in the conversation on Discord which you can join by liking us at Patreon uh, or linking it to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Of course, Scott, it wouldn't be an episode of DTNS without a little mailbag action. And we have a great email from Dwayne who wanted to weigh in on the whole uh, epic Apple battle. It's not an epic battle. It's an ep epic Apple battle. There we go. <laughs> uh, so he said, percent is not just to facilitate the specific transaction, but the fee that funds the economy of the App Store. If Apple allowed free apps to be in the App Store and receive all the value of the ecosystem without contribution by allowing in-app purchases outside the App Store, it would be a windfall for large developers and shift the cost to smaller developers who can't afford to facilitate their own payment system. Either Apple would have to support the App Store economy as a loss leader, or small developers alone would be paying for the SDK, not wholly covered by the relatively low cost of the developer program fees, the hosting cost of distribution, the App Store editorials, the marketplace ratings, et cetera, et cetera. This said, I think Apple should allow developers to sideload apps outside the App Store if they choose or if they uh, want to use a payment system other than Apple's. However, these apps shouldn't be listed in the App Store. As such, they wouldn't get featured in editorials, be listed below other apps using Apple's recommend, uh, recommendation algorithm, won't be listed in App Store rankings, won't be automatically updated. You know, you get the idea. Yes, I know that many developers would then complain that this solution is unfair because of all the value in the App Store. But then, doesn't that prove that Apple's point that the App Store offers value commensurate with the 30% revenue share? I love a good email with commensurate as a, as a sign off, yeah. Dwayne. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting argument. I, I don't think there is a easy answer for Apple here. Um, we, you know, Google does allow the sideloading thing and they're still getting sued by Epic, uh, for delisting them from the Google play store. Now, admittedly under a different rationale and stuff like that. Um, but I don't think that wholly solves the problem. Uh, you know, uh, I, I know um, uh, John Gruber over on his blog has been kind of breaking this down and and kind of looking at um, the the uh, from a developer standpoint some of the uh, uh, economics of the whole App Store kerfuffle that's currently going on. Um, he is a smarter man than I, so if you want to check that out, you can always go over there uh, and check that. But thanks, Dwayne, for sending that email. Good stuff. That's a great email. I just want to say again how great the thinking is here, and I actually kind of agree with what he's saying, and I kind of wish they would do what he says. It's a great idea. Well done. Uh, another thing that's well done is this shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster <laughs> levels, including Philip Shane, Paul Reese, and High Tech Oki. The last thing, of course, Scott, that we need to do is say thank you to you, Scott. You were an amazing uh, co-host on this uh, journey across the daily tech news. Um, I knew it would be, but we're still at our destination, and I, I'm, I treasure the journey that we went on together. Where can people find more of your great stuff if they are so inclined? Well, there's a few things going on. Uh, one of them is we're about to launch uh, this hot new season, starting with episode two of Current Geek, which you'll find over at frogpants.com and currentgeek.com. Um, so watch for that. Rich helped us write the thing. Uh, we, have a, we have an editor. We have me. We have Tom. We have all kinds of rad stuff to show people. So be ready for that. If you already have the feed, you'll just get it. You don't have to do anything special. If you already subscribe to it on iTunes or wherever you get it, uh, Apple Play, wherever, or Google Play is what I meant, you can get it. It's <laughs> no problem. All these names today are throwing me off. Anyway, all of that and more at frogpants.com. Go check it out. And if you're interested in dumb daily musings, you can find me on Twitter at Scott Johnson. And remember, you can always support our show at any level at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. 
All right. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live, of course, Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC, which is how I keep track of it. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And remember, tune in tomorrow. We're going to have Justin Robert Young on the show. Good times will be had by all. Until then, remember, everybody, have a super sparkly day. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>